The following audio has been brought to you by Word of Grace Community Church. For more information about Word of Grace, visit wogcc.com. One of our core values here at Word of Grace is that the church is not just somewhere we go, it's who we are. We say this often because we need to be reminded as we go through the ebb and flow of life that we're just not here to check off a box, that we're just not here to go through the motions of some sort of religious obligation that we feel. But indeed, we are truly understanding every day, whether it's Sunday, whether it's Monday, whether it's Tuesday, regardless of the time of the day, that church is not just somewhere we go, that it's who we are. We are called to be a part of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ every moment, every single day, every role that we have, We are the body of Christ. When something is important in your life, you're going to definitely uh, see that it affects every part of your life. You're going to see how that important role or that important piece of your life changes your perspective. Think about being a parent and how that doesn't just affect one part of your life, but it affects every part. Of your life. It literally changes you simply because now you have a new responsibility. This new role that's been given to you has become a part of who you are because now you're a parent and you see that these little people are looking at you, they're watching you, and they're taking cues from you, both good and bad. I remember one day I was taking my kids to school and where we lived at the time in Falls, We uh, were at a busy intersection where I would have to get on to Highway 23, and if you know anything about heading on Highway 23 early in the morning, if you're heading east into Sheboygan, man, you better cross your fingers and you better be a person of faith because you got to shoot out onto that highway and you got to make sure that you, you know, really punch the gas and you've got some good traction on the tires. And there was one day that I was sitting there, and man, car after car after car after car, And I'm just going, oh my goodness, I cannot pull out on the 23. And I'm just going, come on, seriously? I'm getting really frustrated and I'm vocalizing my frustration. It wasn't just a couple of days later that we're in the same situation, same spot, and we're sitting there looking and the cars are coming again. And my daughter Abigail, who was eight at the time, says, come on, seriously, give me a break. Why are all these cars eight years old? Why is she even concerned about traffic? And in that moment, I realized, oh man, (laughs) I heard many me come out (laughs) at that moment. The influence that you have with your child has affected your behavior. It changes because before I had kids, I wouldn't have thought about that. I wouldn't have thought about the fact that I was complaining to people who weren't hearing what I was saying and the fact that they should let me out and the fact that just because you're in, you know, the other lane, all you got to do is just scoot over to the next lane and let me out. It's not hard, people, but <laughs> Jesus is working on me. He's helping me. <laughs> but my role as a parent changed my perspective. It changed the way I thought about the words I said. And sometimes I forget about that, but I'm reminded in moments like that one where my daughter parroted what I had said many times before with my own frustrations. Because parenting is not just a role that I have that I get to turn on and turn off when it's convenient. It's not something that I can go, okay, I'm done being a parent. I want to go be not a parent right now. It changes everything. It changes the way I manage my money. Things I would have used to have gone and just spent money on, now I'm going, well, well, got to get stuff for the kids. Got to make sure I'm thinking about the kids when I go, you know, and buy groceries. Now I'm not just thinking about myself, not just thinking about me and my spouse. I'm now thinking about another person because it has changed everything. It's touched everything. It's touched my schedule. Now I just can't go and do whatever because I got to think. I got to make sure the kids get taken care of. It has impacted every area of my life. It has become a part of who I am. It is not just something I turn on and turn off. So should be those of us who are in Christ and who have become new creation, where old things have passed away and all things have become new. It doesn't affect one part of my life. No, it changes everything. 
It affects every single part of my life. Christ at the center of my life begins to touch every part of my life. And now I'm thinking differently about the words I say. I'm thinking differently about the way I handle my money. I'm thinking differently about the way I manage my time. I'm thinking differently about the influences I allow in my life. Before, I didn't think as much about the things that were on television. When I have a little person, oh, you better believe I'm thinking a lot more about some of the things that may come across even on a commercial. Why? Because something has changed. Something has impacted me and affected me so deeply that it has changed what I value. It has changed the way I manage things. It has changed the decisions that I make. So should be Christ to us who say we are followers of Christ because we are the body of Christ. Church is not somewhere we go. It is who we are. 1 Corinthians 12 and 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and individually you are members of it. Now you are, underline that, you are. That means you who are reading that, you are now the body of Christ and individually members of it. When something is a part of who we are, it doesn't turn off because there's responsibility attached to it. That's why it doesn't turn off, because there's responsibility there. That's why I'm thinking differently about my role as a parent because there's responsibility attached to it. If there weren't responsibility attached to it and there wasn't uh, something I felt responsible for, then I would be making irresponsible decisions. Every irresponsible parenting decision is made because we didn't take responsibility in that moment for the role that we have been given. And we make those decisions. We make bad decisions. I get it. But more times than not, if we truly are parents who want to succeed and have successful children, what are we going to do? We're going to take that mantle of responsibility back and go, I was being irresponsible. I need to step back into responsibility with my words or my thoughts or my actions or what's allowed, not allowed. What I do, how I behave, how I manage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's how it should be with those who follow Christ. There is a responsibility attached to being a part of the body of Christ. There's a responsibility that you and I have and it's something that needs to be felt by us. But the only way it's going to be felt by those of us who are followers of Jesus is if we have the value and the understanding and the core belief that church is just not somewhere we go. If we just think it's somewhere we go, we'll never take responsibility. We'll always be check the box. We'll always be just showing up to be seen. We'll always just come and be a part of this once a week event. Or we'll be just casually involved in following Christ. And the casualness of following Christ becomes maybe my own uh, uh, way or my own method to self soothe or maybe some way just to feel better or whatever the case may be. And I know that it's good when you walk away from church and feel better. I, I want those things to happen. I want you to have good experiences, but it doesn't stop on Sunday. Amen, somebody. It doesn't stop on Sunday. This is an everyday thing. That means when you're in the car waiting on traffic, you're still the church in front of your kids. That means you're still the church when you show up for work and you have expectations of you at work where you're supposed to be responsible and show up on time and be a good employee and do a good job, you are representing Christ, not just you. It's bigger than you because you are now a follower of Christ. And there should be a responsibility attached to that with every role that we have because Christ at the center has affected everything that we do. We as the body of Christ have been given a responsibility to use what we've been given to impact eternity, to make an eternal impact. This is much bigger than anything we'll experience temporarily here on this earth. We're talking about eternity and we have a responsibility as followers of Christ to use what God's given us and what he's told us to make an impact in eternity. Romans 12 and verse 4 through 6 says this, Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and not all members have the same function, so in Christ we who are many are one body, and each member belongs to one another. We have different gifts according to the grace 
that's been given to us. Each one of us has a gift. I don't care who you are. I don't, I'm not talking about you're super talented and you can stand up on the stage and sing. That's great when people can do that and we appreciate those gifts. I'm not talking about someone who's just really good at math. I'm not talking about someone who can just be really good in one certain area. No, you have gifts on the inside of you, plural gifts on the inside of you that God has given you, some of which you may be aware of, some you may not be aware of, but as you grow in responsibility as a follower of Christ and you take responsibility for the church not just being somewhere you go but who you are, you begin to discover these gifts because you're looking for opportunities to impact eternity. And because you say, yes, I'm available all of a sudden you begin to explore something you hadn't explored before and realize there's a gift in you you didn't know was in you. And that God had given you a passion or He had stirred your heart or, or directed your heart a certain way. And now you're, you're, you're excited about something that maybe you weren't excited about before. You didn't know you would be excited about because you said yes to an opportunity. You said yes and God has given you this gift and you didn't even know you had this gift. But all of a sudden, the connection to the opportunity, because of the feeling and the recognition of responsibility, it has lit you up for Jesus. And you're on fire for God and wanting to do something for God and make an impact on eternity because you realize that every moment of every day matters. And you live your life with a different sense of purpose. So what has God said and what has God given you? These are the two questions that I want you to write down. And I want you to ask yourself these things. What has God said? And what has God given you? These are the two questions that we need to focus on when excuses want to rise up. Because excuses are going to want to come. It's natural for us to make excuses, to justify why we're not living our lives for a greater purpose on purpose. There's all these justifications, and we all have the same song that we sing. It just may sound a little different, but really the heart is still the same of making all these excuses. I'm too busy. I think the B word is one of the worst words in Christianity because we say this word all the time. I'm just busy. I'm busy. How are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. Or the other one, the T word. You guys know this word? I'm tired. And if you really want to use explicitives, you say both together. Oh, I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm tired and busy. I used to have a friend in Texas. I love this guy. But every time you talk to him, he's always tired. Every time he'd scratch his belly when he'd say it. You go, hey, Nick, how you doing? He'd go, I'm tired. And every time I hear someone just say they're tired or I say it, I think about Nick. Oh, I'm tired. Every time you would talk to the guy. And these are things that we just say automatically, oftentimes without even thinking. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> every time. And we go down the list of excuses for why we're not living our lives with a greater purpose. We go down our laundry list of excuses of why we're not doing what God has told us to do. This is nothing new because these are really the two things that God confronted Abraham and Moses with were these two things. What did I say and what have I given you? We see in Genesis 17 that God visited Abraham when he was 99 years old and said, hey, you know that promise that I told you before that you're going to be a father of many nations and you're going to have all these kids? I know you're old. I know you're 99. But guess what? You're still going to have a kid. You're still going to be the father of many nations, of a great nation that's going to come out of you. It's going to be amazing. Go look at the sand. Go look at the stars. Count them if you can. That's the number of your descendants. You're not going to be able to count them. There's going to be so many. Well, I'm old and I'm tired. <laughs> And my wife, she's old. And God, don't you know that Sarah is past childbearing years? And God's like, you know, I forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. And God said, what, what did I say? Do you trust me? Do you trust me when I told you this is what's going to happen? It's your job to just trust and then use what I've given you. Moses, hey Moses, you're going to be the guy that's going to lead the children of Israel. 
out of slavery. They've been slaves for 400 years. The, the generation that's now alive at that time, all they knew was slavery. They didn't even know what freedom meant. They were born into slavery. They were raised in slavery, and so were their parents before them. So this is a generational mentality of slavery. This is all I know is I work. If I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I get beat, so I try to do the, to the best of my ability and not upset the Egyptians. I don't want to be stoned or killed or whipped. And this is the only reality I've ever known if I grew up as a Hebrew. And now all of a sudden, God says, hey, Moses, you're going to be the guy that's going to go and do this. And he's like, you know, you kind of picked the worst guy. I just want to let you know, in case you don't know who I am, God's like, I know who you are. I made you. I know your limitations. I know your struggles. I know your limitations. And that's kind of why I chose you. Not because you're so strong, not because you're so great, not because you can just rely on yourself and how great you are. No, all of these weaknesses are going to make you rely on me all the more. So when people look at you as the leader, they're going to go, really, that guy? That's kind of what happened when I became your pastor six years ago. <laughs> it's not because I'm so great. <laughs> so when God uses people, it's not because they're so amazing or so impressive. It's so God can show off. Not so God can draw attention to the person, but so God can draw attention to himself. And so God can say, look at how good and powerful and almighty and, and that I am, that I'm able to use someone like Moses, the guy that shouldn't have been picked, the guy that, you know, he, he, he got picked last. Look at how amazing I am and look at how faithful and good that I am, that I'm still going to fulfill my promise even when it looks impossible, and there's two people that are way too old to be having a kid. And I'm not just going to give them one kid, but I'm going to allow that kid to be the start of something that's going to change the world. What? Could you pick someone a little bit younger, a little bit more spry? Moses said, I can't speak well. I have a speech impediment. Don't you know I kind of struggle with talking? He said, don't you know everyone in Egypt hates me? And God goes, exactly. And God gets excited about that. God gets excited about the fact that Moses is not the sharpest tool in the shed to make this happen on his own. And then God asked Moses, what do you have? And he said, I've got a stick. That's all i got. I've got a stick. What do you want to do with this? I want to do some really cool things with that stick. Throw it down on the ground and watch what my power can do with what you have that you thought was insignificant, that you just thought was some old stick that you carved and you've been walking with for years, that you've been shepherding sheep with for all these years. Look at what I can do with something so simple, something that you thought was worthless. And it wasn't because Moses had a magical walking stick. It was because God took something ordinary and did something supernatural. But he had to let it go. He had to release it. He had to trust God. He had to obey. He had to step into it. And that's our role. We have to take what God has said and what God has given us and use those things for His glory instead of making all the excuses to why we can't. That's what we want to do. I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm not good enough. Don't you know my past? Don't you know that everyone knows all the bad things I've done? If you looked at my rap sheet, you, God couldn't use me. Guess what? God used all kinds of people that probably had a rap sheet as worse than you did. He used a guy who killed Christians for a living and had them persecuted to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Go figure that one out. God used a guy who everyone thought was this awful, terrible person that they feared as Christians named Saul, who God radically changed his life. And he didn't all of a sudden become this amazing powerhouse of a person. No, he was the worst person to choose. If you and I were picking teams, who's going to be like on our evangelism team? We wouldn't pick the guy that's hunting us down. <laughs> but God picked the guy who was hunting us down. How crazy is that? So don't tell me that God can't use you. Don't tell me your past is too dark. Don't tell me you've made too many mistakes. Don't tell me that you're not good enough. Because listen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
That means you. That means me. That means without Christ, we're all in the same boat, and it's not headed to a good place. But because of Christ, we all get to be in the family of God headed to a wonderful place. But that's not the end of the story. It's just for us to have our security and our salvation in Christ, and then we just go about our day-to-day lives and not think about anything with any amount or measure of purpose. No, it should be the exact opposite. Because of Christ and because of what He's done for us, it should stir us and motivate us to action, to recognize the responsibility that we have because God has said some things to us and He's given us things and He wants us to use those different gifts that He's given us by His grace. God has said, you are the body of Christ. That we are the church everywhere we go. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. He said, you have gifts. You have influence. You have a story. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21 says this, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. He's given us a responsibility. He's given us a task. Verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself and no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. He gave it to us. He's saying, here, take this message, do something with it, verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who had never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Wow. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. This is the responsibility that we've been given. This is the role we've been called to. This is Christ affecting everything we do, not just one segment of one day once a week. This is us understanding we are the body of Christ, that God is is interested in the small things, that God is in the every day. He's in the every day. He's in every day in the, and, and the simple things that we may blow off or pass off as just a regular routine. If we live our lives with the value that Jesus is the center, then everything in our lives, the way we parent, the way we manage our time, the way we engage our spouse, our work ethic, our morality, all of those things should stem from the center. And the center is Christ. And He is in the everyday. You have everyday routines. You have everyday influence. You have everyday opportunities that God has given you to leverage for His kingdom. And as the church as representatives of Christ, every single day is a divine opportunity from God. I remember when I was younger, I used to pray and ask God for divine opportunities. And what I meant by that is I would say in the morning when I would pray, I would say, God, give me a divine opportunity just to minister to someone, to see you move in someone's life, or give me an opportunity, help me to see those things, to be aware of those things. And there's some validity to that prayer, but what I didn't realize was that every day was the divine opportunity. It wasn't that I'm going to go about my life hoping that a divine opportunity would show up, but the day itself was the divine opportunity. It's His breath in our lungs, right? It's His schedule that we're on. We even get this at work. We know, hey, don't stand around, you're on the clock. Hey, don't stand around. You're on the clock. Hey, don't just sit on your hands. You're on the clock. You have a purpose. You have a responsibility. It's not something we check in and check out of. It's not something that we can conveniently set aside, just like we can't conveniently set aside being a parent or being a a, a mate or or, or being that, that person that God has called us to be. It's a part of who we are now. It's changed everything. 
So I need to always be ready. Scripture says always be ready to give an account of why you believe what you believe, the reason for your faith. Always been in season. That means we're always on ready. Every day is a divine opportunity. Every moment, every role that you have is a part of that divine opportunity. Your, your job is a part of your divine opportunity. When you go to work, it's part of your divine opportunity. When you sit around the, the kitchen table and you have a meal with your family, it's a divine opportunity. When you're riding in the car to church or when you're riding in the car on a family vacation, guess what? Divine opportunity. When you go to the store, when you go to the restaurant, divine opportunity. When you're hanging out with your friends, divine opportunity. Are, are, are you getting this? Every day, every moment is a divine opportunity because God's in the every day. He doesn't go, oh, that's little stuff. I don't care about that. I don't care about that stuff. That's insignificant. No, it's not insignificant because it's His breath in your lungs. We're on the clock. He's calling us to take responsibility for this thing. He's calling us to take responsibility for this, this job that He has given us of being the mouthpiece of God to reconcile people back to Christ, to, to show them the goodness of God, to show them the message that's being lived out through us by using the opportunities and the influence that we've been given in the everyday, in the everyday, living life with a different purpose on purpose. So what if we viewed the connections that God has already given us as an opportunity to impact eternity? Everyone is asking God for something more because we always think more is better, especially us who are, you know, in America, we think more is better, more is the answer, right? More money, more this, more that, you know. But what if more is not the answer to you discovering the purpose that God has given you? What if it's taking responsibility for what you've already got? What if it's you just stepping up with what He's already put in your hand? I mean, He said, let me use something simple that you thought was insignificant, Moses. Something you thought was just a part of the everyday mundane routine of you walking with this staff. I'm going to take that simple thing and I'm going to do something amazing with it that's going to be all about me that you could have never done with it. But because I'm awesome and I, and I want to use you, I want to take something ordinary. God was trying to show Moses, you're the stick. That's what he was trying to show him. That's what he was trying to get him to understand. Moses, you're the stick. You're that thing that you thought was nothing, that was insignificant, that had no special ability. And God says, I want to use it if you will allow me to do something through you that you could have never done on your own. But you've got to trust me. You're the plain, ordinary, nothing special about me. I don't even have a good testimony story. I've heard people say that all the time. Stop saying that. Please, please stop saying that. People think that if they don't have this story with this dark, jaded past and then this aha moment where the skies parted and Jesus himself descended and said, I choose you, come and follow me. And if you don't have this story that makes everybody in the room cry, you think that your story is insignificant. That is a lie from the pit. We all have a story that's, that's significant. We were all lost and now we are found. We all were blind and now we see. We all were without hope and now we have hope. We all have the same story, different circumstances, yes, but the same story if we know Christ. And no one's story of how they found Christ is any more significant or less significant than the other. No one's story is more or less compelling because of the surrounding circumstances because we were all dead without Christ and now we are made alive because of Christ. Folks, we got to get past this comparison thing of feeling like we don't have anything significant because we look at what someone else can do or we look at what someone else is doing. Oh, wow, they up and moved to a different country. Wow, I could never do that. Why is that so significant in contrast to your everyday life? They just said yes to God. What's in your hand? What's He given you that you're supposed to say yes to? Their yes is no greater than your yes. It's your yes that you have to say yes to. It's your opportunity that you have to raise your hand for. 
It's your opportunity that God has given you in the every day that you have to step up and take responsibility for. Stop looking at somebody else and comparing yourself to somebody else and trying to be like somebody else. God, who have you made me to be? What have you said? What have you said and what have you given me? What gifts have you given me? What have you already told me to do? Live on purpose. Live on purpose. Because when we live with a greater intentionality in our lives, we are going to have a greater impact. We're called to make an eternal impact. And God has given you connections. Influence increases as responsibility is taken for what God has already said. Stop asking God for more and start taking responsibility for what you've already got. God said you've been faithful over a few things, now I'll make you ruler over many things. Stop asking God for more opportunities and start looking at the opportunities already in front of you. And I promise you God will open the door as you take responsibility and that you'll begin to see, wow, God is the one running this show. It's not me sitting back going, well, I'll do something for God when I think it's significant. I'll do something for God when they create the ministry that I want at the church. I'll do something for God when they finally listen to my ideas. How arrogant is that? Why not say yes to the things that are already in front of you? The things God's already saying, will you be faithful with these things I've already put in front of you? And instead of just waiting and sitting on your gifts and sitting on the opportunities, will you just say yes and live on purpose? Because this is not my life. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus has redeemed me and made me now a child of God, and I belong to Him. Taking responsibility for what God has already given you and what God has already told you is called stewardship. We say that a lot in church. You may not hear it a lot outside of church, but it's stewardship. And being a good steward of what God has already given you means I'm just taking responsibility to manage what He's already put in my hand. What He's already given me, my time, my talent, my treasure. Living on purpose as the church, assessing what God has already said and what He's already given us, and being obedient and trusting Him. That's our role, and His role is the results. It's not us trying to manufacture something. It's not us trying to make something. It's God working through those who say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, send me. What do you want me to do? What's my role? What's my responsibility? Just like Moses' role, just like Abraham's role, trust and obey. Grow in faithfulness. In 2018, we've said that we're going to grow stronger, reach farther, and ready up. And it's going to take every one of us as a part of this church body, awakening to the influence that God has given us, stirring up our gifts, and using what we have to impact eternity. And when the church has a greater purpose than once a week service, we're going to make a greater impact for eternity. Wouldn't you agree? Where lives are going to be impacted forever, where the gospel is going to be shared, where people all over the world are going to hear the word of God and his truth proclaimed in a real authentic way that makes sense, that empowers them to apply those truths, to deepen their faith in God. And you have time and you have talent, and you have treasure. You have direct and indirect connections. You have friends, you have family, you have co-workers. You have a social media presence. You have a neighborhood. You have passions. You have routines. You have networks. You have gifts that God has given you, and you have a church that has a vision. For us to accomplish our vision, we need to awaken to influence and rise up, because God is calling us to grow stronger, to reach farther, and ready up for what's next. And I want to be clear a lot of the things that I talked to you about last week in our vision, talking about creating our area in the commons service. I, I hate the word overflow because I don't necessarily like the, the fact that it would be just an overflow because you can look and maybe you see that there's some chairs that are available and you go, why would we need to do an overflow? Listen, we're not being reactive here with this where we're trying to respond to something. We're wanting to be proactive to set the stage to reach people we're not yet reaching because there are people who are going to be reached with that type of opportunity that's setting the stage for us to do what's next that we're not reaching yet. 
Just as we're looking to ready up for a third service and we want 300 people to serve on Team WOG, we're not doing that in response to the fact that we're busting at the seams and you can't find a seat in the joint. I don't want to be reactive with this. I want to be proactive to where we're readying up and getting ready for what's next. And when we offer a third service, guess what? That's going to be another opportunity to reach people we're not yet reaching because maybe they can't come to church on a Sunday morning and another day of the week is a better opportunity for them because of work or because of what, whatever the case may be. We're creating more opportunities for people to connect to the message of the gospel, to connect relationally with other people. That's why we want to have more community groups this year. This is why we're putting goals out there and things I want you to pray about and see what your role is and how you're supposed to be a part of it because we're creating more opportunities to connect more people to God and to other people so they can love God, love people, and serve the world. Are you getting this? And it takes all of us. It's not because we're responding to something. It's not because we're reacting to something. No, we're trying to get ahead of the curve and say we want to create more opportunities to reach more people. We're grateful for the people that God has already brought us that we're reaching now. But we know that as God is calling us to make an impact on eternity, that we want more people to hear the message of the gospel. We want more people to be in life-giving, discipling relationships to where they're growing and they're being mentored or they're being sharpened or they're helping to sharpen and using their gifts and finding purpose. Why wouldn't we want that for everybody? Why wouldn't we want that for the whole world? Jesus does. It's not about our four and no more. It's about reaching the world and getting creative with it, looking at the gifts that we have. What do we have? What have you put in our hands? Who are the people you've put in our church? What are the talents? What are the gifts that they have? How can we live with a greater purpose? How can we do something that has a greater purpose? That we begin to redefine the mentality and the church culture in our area. That begins to break the chains of religion that would bind people to think that just church is just somewhere that I go. And it's just something I do. But that we're able to be a light to help to change the culture in this community and in other communities as God gives us influence and opportunity to show them that no church is not somewhere we go. It's who we are. That we are the body of Christ. And we don't just say it, and we don't just wear it on a t shirt, and we don't just amen it or write it down, but they see it lived out. That they see a church who's waking up to that fact. That's waking up and making that thing a reality because we've said yes. Because we've said yes to every day, living our lives on purpose with a greater purpose. That we've said yes to when we're at our jobs that we're reminding ourselves, I'm still the church. I'm still the body of Christ. I'm still representing Christ. How can I use this opportunity of this job? How can I use the interaction that I have with these other people? How can I use it for the glory of God? How would God be glorified when everybody else is complaining about the fact that hours got cut back? How are you going to respond? Because you're the church. You're the body of Christ. You have a different opportunity you can go and talk about what everybody else is talking about around the water cooler and nobody will know anything different. But you're the church. You have a responsibility just like the things you would talk about around your kids. You, you know there's a different responsibility attached because it's who I am. And because of that, I want to try to encourage people or pray for people or I want to make a statement of faith or whatever the case may be in that moment to show the love and truth of Christ in those scenarios. You just thought that you were getting that promotion to make your life more comfortable. That you were just chasing after that promotion because you wanted to buy that nicer home. But what you didn't know is that God was setting you up to give you opportunity to get someone's ear you didn't have before. Because you're living with a different purpose. And now you're engaging and talking to people on a different level who may have a greater influence than maybe even you have and God uses you in a way to point them to Christ or to point them to church or to, to point them towards life-giving, uh, discipling relationships. And all of a sudden, that person looks at their gifts and looks at the things God has given them. And now they're using their influence to be able to impact eternity. But somebody's got to say yes somewhere. You know, in our nation, we just laid to rest one of the greatest evangelists of our time in the Reverend Billy Graham. Somebody reached Billy Graham we may or may not know that person's name if you follow Billy Graham's story. But I would guarantee you most of us don't know who shared the gospel with Billy Graham. Somebody did. And how many millions of people did he share the gospel with? 
You never know what God is using you to do. So stop looking at yourself as an insignificant stick (laughs) that can't offer or do anything. Instead, say, God, what did you say? What is my role? What am I supposed to do with what you've told me? And live with a greater purpose to leverage our influence for the kingdom. God is calling us to share the gospel, to make disciples, fully devoted followers of Jesus that are growing in loving God, loving people, serving the world. So what has God said? And what has God given you? I want to encourage you today to use it for His glory, to impact eternity. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to share this word with our church family. I pray that you would help the stirring on the inside of us to transition into action. That it would be more than just a stirring. But it would be a stirring where we step out in faith and put action behind the stirring. To step up and to say, God, what have you said? What did you tell us to do? What has been that thing that you have been drawing our hearts towards? What is that thing that you've been opening up in front of us as an opportunity to say yes to? What's the thing that we felt compelled to do that you have been nudging us and reminding us to say yes to? Whether it be at work, whether it be at home, whether it be in our marriage, whether it be here at Word of Grace. What's the thing that you're nudging us to that we need to say yes to? What's the thing that you have stirred us to that we need to stop making excuses for? I pray that you would stir up courage on the inside of us to be able to say yes and to deepen our faith, to be able to trust, to step out in faith instead of, instead of making excuses. Help us to live our lives on purpose for a greater purpose. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this sermon from Word of Grace. For more sermons or any other information, visit wogcc.com.